everyone. Welcome to the NPR Network and the Boas, Boas, Boas podcast with your hosts, Rob Stone, Keith McPeak, and I, Warren Booth. And on today's show, we'll be talking about the Boa Constrictor Complex. Sit back and we hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, how are you? Good. How are you, Ben Warren? Well, I'm surviving. You know, I had the the joy of a three week vacation, and then I was back here for a couple of weeks, and then I'm heading off tomorrow again for another week's vacation. You know, the, didn't, the you, uh, didn't you go to the IHS or something too? No, I went out to the biology of pit vipers meeting. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was in um, in uh, Rodeo, New Mexico, at Bob Ashley's place at the Chiricahua Desert Museum. Nice. So that that meeting. Myself and a guy called Gordon Shewitt. Um, people might know of the Shewitt line, Brazilian rainbows and hog islands and carpet pythons. Um, Gordy and his brothers um, were big into snake breeding back in the day, but also Gordon's a, a, an academic, he's a PhD. And uh, he and I have wrote a number of papers together. And I don't know, maybe seven, no, maybe nine, nine or 10 years ago, he and I had this crazy idea to resurrect a pit viper meeting that was held 25 years prior and we did it we held it in tulsa and it was a big success and since then nice. it's been held three more times so it was definitely a good meeting you know a lot of really good academics and um a lot of really neat talks about pit vipers you know and it's in a great location you have you been there to to rodeo and to portal yeah i went with uh actually rob uh had set up a trip i, I got to go with uh justin uh julander and yeah rob and Owen was there and Tom, Rob cool. and Tom. Was there. It was very yeah. cool. It's yeah. a great place. You, know, you get that Cave Creek Canyon or whatever, you know, when you're driving up one from the portal store and yeah. it's unbelievable. And that's just like a mecca for, for herpetologists and herpeticulturists. Yeah. There's a lot of people live there that are just really into, into reptiles. Yeah. A lot of birders there too. A lot of birders. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, the season gets a massive influx of people there for, for birds, you know, yeah. and uh, and reptiles, you know, I, I my feed on Facebook is um, all of my friends that are there currently. You know, whenever I was there, um, maybe for five days, um, there was no rains really. You know, normally you're in the monsoon season, you know, but and, and it's a lot of fun, but it was dry, so it was kind of a bit disappointing for that. But you know, I didn't I didn't go out herping. I sat and drank beer and talked to talk snakes. <laughs> <and> so, <laughs> yeah. you know, I've been there enough times to go herping, so it was a yeah, lot of fun. Pop. Bob's place, as we, he was showing us a quick tour of the place, uh, all I kept saying to myself was, this is the real deal. This is oh, the yeah. real deal. You know? Oh, yeah. That place That's was like, You know, for, no, for people that haven't been to the Chiricahua Desert Museum, you, you walk into it and you've got a, a room to the left, which is all kind of herpetology, herpeticulture kind of memorabilia. Um, you've got a back room that's got reptiles, some, a, lot, a lot of rattlesnakes and so on and from that area. But outside, there's a whole area which has got these massive enclosures that have yeah. got Gila monsters in them, and just every and, and, you know, just crazy animals. You know, I go very early in the morning. I'll go out for a walk around there, and you'll find you know hognose snakes and just just yeah. wandering around. It's just amazing, you know. Yeah. That's yeah. a little play thing, you know. It's kind of cool, right? Yeah. And then his private collections in behind all of that there. Yeah, yeah. We, we got to see some of that too. Yeah. It's uh, it's pretty amazing, you know. Yeah. So, like I said, I just kept saying, "This is the real deal." <laughs> yeah. oh, I know. Yeah, whenever I saw an outdoor enclosure that size for Gila monsters, I was yeah. like, "Yeah, that's it. I'm done." <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> lab, you know, just great. But it, it's but it's been it's been a good summer, you know. It's uh, it was a quiet summer for snake breeding for me because I had the potential of moving in August, and that's now been delayed until January moving over to the east coast but um as a result i didn't pair many snakes but the snake cycle so i i did pair some and, and i've had a litter of emerald tree boas um, a day or two before that a litter of costa rican russian burger eye and then i've had two litters of boas one boa sigma litter and one boa imperator litter and then i've got one more boa sigma litter due in the next kind of week or two nice so my awesome. quiet year turned into five litters which is kind of yeah. crazy yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah how and about you uh, my bow is, um, kind of striking out this year with the first two. I had, uh, my Roshan burger eye drop. And unfortunately, uh, I think you saw the results. I had some stillborn and some slugs and I went and checked my annulated boa last night cause she was about doing, and another one had slugged out on me. So no way. I saw somebody else had that as well. Like Adam, 
Adam did, yeah. yeah he He's pretty him. close to me too. I, I yeah. you know, for whatever that's worth, but he he lives relatively close to me. Um, but I still have an emerald that's probably about twenty days out uh, from going. Uh, I have a hog aisle that's uh, getting close. Um, you know, for the boas, what else? I have a uh, pulsana that I think is getting really close. And that's probably it for the boas. But what about Sanzinia? Oh, yeah, I got a Sanzinia. She's uh, she's probably still about a month and a half out. Green or? or, or a green. Uh, yeah, that's all I keep now. I, I yeah. used to keep them both and breed them both. But nowadays, I just keep the green. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. When I was um, when I was in New Mexico, I was there. A friend of mine, Rich Eiley, was there. You know, he was mm-hmm. the salmon boa kind of guy back in the day. So anybody that's got a salmon hypo boa, they were you know originated from him. And he was the guy that brought the scoria boas to kind of more more attention and so and did a lot of work with blood boas. But um, he sent me a message uh, whenever I just arrived home. He he had a litter of twelve mandarin sanzania. Oh, nice. And that other guy up in, in Portal had a, a litter of six, but four were stillborn. Yeah. Um, and then... I, I think talking, Ian, Ian Bissell, right? Didn't he, he just had, had a litter too? Like, I think he had four. Yeah. And then uh, Bill Hughes had five, maybe? Or yeah. Also, kind of four litters of Mandarin Sanzania within like a week of yeah. each other. Kind of cool. Yeah. 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 Hey, just for you guys listening, Rob Stone is with us tonight, <laughs> but uh, he's having a little mic problem, so he's on mute uh, for right now, but he'll be jumping in from time to time. And also just wanted to say that uh, we did record this constrictor show once before, but we were having some technical difficulties, so this is going to be a reboot of that show, and uh, hopefully we got everything right this time, so Eric does not have a nightmare editing it. <laughs> it was, yeah, and that was a while ago, I think just because we had... You know, I was on vacation, then you were on vacation. Yeah, it's we hard to get, yeah. Trying to get our timings to, yeah. to, to match up, you know. But here we have it. Thankfully, I leave tomorrow morning at like 7 a.m. So I will be on worry. vacation for another week. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I'm glad we're going to talk about this. So this is uh, this should be a fun episode. It was fun last time. So hopefully yes. it'll be a second time around. Absolutely. And uh, so I think basically you got us started with kind of going over the different species and, and the localities and uh, – kind of giving us a background of all those uh, different animals in the complex. Yeah. So, you know, like boas for me have just been a fascinating, I'm going to, I'm going to call it species, just boa constrictor in general. And that's going to cover a whole variety of different animals, different localities and different species. But whenever I think about those, they're the species that really got me interested in snakes. You know, I, I first kept hognose snakes and then some king snakes and then like, like ball pythons and, and Amazon tree boas. But whenever I got boa constrictors, which would have been Boa Sigma then, now, um, that just changed my whole view on snakes. And I just thought these things were fascinating. And since then, there's not been a day in the last, I think, 28 years where I haven't owned a stupid amount of boas, right, of Boa Sigma and Boa Imperator. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to work on a number of research projects with boas, include, including a paper that renamed or brought a, a species to light, which was Boa Sigma, and we'll talk about that. But whenever I think about boas as boa constrictor, the big thing is their geographic range. They're really widespread compared to many other species. These things have a, a massive range going from, you know, the Sonora Desert, which would be their kind of northern maximum range, all the way down through Mexico into Central America, through Panama, Costa Rica, Honduras, and so on, and then into South America and spreading all the way down to northern Argentina, which is just remarkable whenever you think about the climatic variation that occurs in nighttime temperatures and daytime temperatures and the kind of evolutionary constraints that has been put on that species that has resulted in this really remarkable diversification. So we have three species that are currently recognized. Those are the Boa Sigma. So if we think about Boa Sigma, I'll just talk about their geographic range to start off with. These are the, the, the Northern range of the species. So think about Mexico, this would be on the uh, eastern coast, on, on the Pacific coast. So Sonora all the way down um, uh, to the um, isthmus of Tehuantepec, which is that kind of narrowing of the the, the, the narrowest point in Mexico. Mm-hmm. And that's Boa Sigma. And it occurs on some islands there as well. In fact, the type locality, I think, is from an island, is from one of the islands. Then you have Boa Imperator, and it's extremely wide-ranging. It, it's from, uh, you know, if we think about 
Western kind of uh, Mexico, um, like Veracruz, Yucatan, and then it goes all the way down through the Isthmus of Panama, so Belize, Honduras, um, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, and then into South America, so into Colombia and Venezuela, and even right down on the on the Pacific coast again into Peru, we still have Imperator. And then from there, we then see in the main body of, of uh, South America, you've got the constrictor, constrictor, right, the true red tails. The, uh, Guyana, Suriname, part of Colombia, part of Venezuela, you know, into Brazil, um, into into Peru, and then if we go even further, you've got um, boa constrictor occidentalis, the, the big Argentine boas, which are again really different and perfectly evolved and adapted to their environments, which are very different than what you'll find in Guyana and what you'll find in Central America and so on. And then they even occur on islands, right? We got. Boa uh, constrictor nebulosa and boa constrictor orophius. I'm convinced both of those are going to get resurrected to full species once work is done on them. They're mm-hmm. so phenotypically different, and they're on on different islands. And we we just have a, a remarkable diversity of habitats that they've evolved in, and sizes as a result. You know, we're going to talk about some of the little key boas tonight. Some people call them k boas; they're actually pronounced keys. And these things can be three feet in length as adults. Compared to, you know, there's that picture that Tom Crutchfield sometimes posts on Facebook of a, of a red tail that they say is like 14 feet. Yeah. It's a big snake. I don't know about 14 feet, right. but it's, it's a big ass snake, right? Yeah. And I think that just shows the diversity in that kind of, in this kind of group, which I think is just outstanding. There's something for everyone. Well, let me ask you a question, Warren, because I notice I have my hog island line is from Vin Russo. And yeah. the hogs that I've had in the past, uh, they were pure hogs also, but I noticed a, quite a size difference between the animals that I have from Vin and his, even his animal, he has his hand next to a gravid female. Yeah. And it's a lot smaller than like what, how I remember the old oh, yeah. generation, if I want to say. So do you see, yeah. do you feel that there's a different line even within the locality or the, you know, hog aisles as far I think as within, the size differences? Yeah, I think within localities, you get variation just as you find humans. Right. You know, like I work a lot with Costa Rican boas and my Costa Ricans that are 15 year old might be five feet in length for an adult female, maybe three and a half for a male. There was another picture posted from a a snake caught in Costa Rica relatively recently, which looked about 10 feet in length. It Mm -hmm. looked like a genuinely big animal. Um, We got to remember the snakes don't stop growing. Right. So if the animal lives long enough, they can get pretty big. I had a Sonoran boa years ago that was probably about seven and a half feet. It was an enormous beast. Um, you know, the, the thing to mention ab- about Vin, and he's very similar to me in that in the way we keep animals is that we feed really sparsely. Mm-hmm. So that's gonna change the adult size of an animal at breeding, right? So what would be four or five years old for him might be eating a smaller or medium rat for other people that are feeding. And he's feeding, you know, every two to three weeks and not feeding from November through to March, kind of similar to what I do. I believe that's the way he works. Other people might feed every week. And as a result, you get big snakes. Right. You know, I've talked to people that have um, worked on the KS Coquinas Islands where the hog island boas exist. And I've asked them about size. And while they'll say that the majority of the animals they see that are breeding are about four feet, four and a half feet in length. Males are smaller. They tend to be very arboreal. They tend to find them in trees. And that's something common that we see on island boas. They tend to be found in trees um, because they're they're eating birds and so on. But they also find six feet or seven feet long females. But he said they're broom handle thin. They're not getting the animals that they need to eat and therefore to survive and to breed at that point. So these are old animals that are just barely subsisting on an iguana here and there. Um, So we've seen it in captivity. Like I remember early on, you know, the hog islands came into the into into the hobby between I think it was like seventy nine and eighty six is whenever you got that mass import of them. Mm-hmm. I remember in the early nineties seeing animals that were wild caught and or first generation, and they were six feet, six and a half feet. They were just the size of a of a common boa, the you know, common imperator. That's what like, mine were, and that's about the right time range. She nailed it. <laughs> But again, we probably fed them. Whenever I started keeping my boas, I was feeding them every week, yeah. you know, and, and you got them up to a big size and they were feeding on jumbo rats or stillborn pigs or rabbits, you know, right. these things are weak. Whether that's physiologically good for them, we can argue that. Um, but, you know, they can they can definitely get big. Now, what's different is that I don't see that happening with these little 
Kibo is the crawl key, the cocker key, the West Snake Kibos. They tend to be small, and I think that's a um, evolutionarily there's been selection for smaller size mm-hmm. um, because of diet, diet constraints. Right. But yeah, you see, even within localities, I think you're going to find big animals. And what we call a dwarf boa doesn't necessarily mean it's actually a dwarf boa. It means in that habitat, in that locality where it was existing, its size of the, if we looked at the mean population, um, their adult size, it was smaller because of the constraints of diet. Yeah, and mean. they age and they're still growing, but they're not getting the diet. Then they get picked off by predators. They get they die of ill health and so on. So therefore, you'll see this mean range of a of a four foot snake on on Hog Island. Um, of course, in in Vin's collection or in mine or whatever, in yours, um, that animal reaches four foot, and we might have a, a very constrained diet the way we're feeding it, and it stays small. Like Vin posts those pictures of a, the snake grab it beside his hand, and they're small. Yeah. My hog islands are a little bit bigger than that. They're probably four and a half feet. Um, and they eat, you know, large rats or, or jumbo rat once a month. But they're certainly not what I saw people growing them to. In, right. In, in these in early 2000s and so on. Right. right. But still, yeah, and I'll, we'll talk about hog islands later on because they're just such a cool animal. Oh, very. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So wide ranging. And you've got three species. You know, the Boa Sigma from Mexico. Um Gulf Coast and our Pacific Coast of Mexico, Boa Imperator, going from essentially Veracruz all the way down to Colombia, and then Constrictor taking over from there. And within Imperator and Constrictor, we have subspecies, and we'll mention those like Boa Imperator Sabogai, uh, or Sabogi, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, on 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 the Pearl Islands, you've got um, Boa Constrictor Constrictor, and so on. You've got a boa constrictor amaralli. So you've got a variety of different subspecies as well, which are phenotypically very different. And I think, again, as genetic work continues, I think you might even see things like boa constrictor amaralli being pulled out as boa amaralli. Again, they're very, very different than yeah. you see, right? You know, there's really key differences. Um, and even longicauda. And I can tell you that with the genetic work that was done, I don't believe longicauda was included. I don't believe amaralli was included. It was mainly sigma um Central American um, Imperator, and then some uh, constrictor from like Guyana or Suriname. I need to go back and look at the samples for that there. But I think, you know, once more samples are added to it, then you might see these things being pulled out as species. I've got mm. tissue samples of Nebulosa and Orophias here, um, and I think Longicotta and a few others. So at some point in time, I need to pull my finger out and, and sequence those, maybe in the neck before I move universities. Yeah. Um, I get those done. That'd be very cool. Yeah, very neat. But so, what do, we, do we want to start with Sigma and talk about those a little bit? Cause, yeah, because I know that's near and dear to your heart. <laughs> the species that sank me into this spiraling hellhole that is. <laughs> and it's because um, myself and a very good friend of mine, Jonathan Harvey, um, have known for maybe close to 30 years, brought in a, a group of boa, of Sonoran boas, Sonoran desert boas, is what they were called from Europe through a, um, an importer and breeder, a guy called Clive Osborne, who lived in London. He had one of the most remarkable locality boa collections in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Sadly, he passed away, but he had Nebulosa and Orophius and F1 hogs and just insane. But he brought over these Sonorans and he, you know, and he called us about them, said they're small as adults. And this was a, a big turn on for me because my buddy Jonathan had this Colombian that was the typical Colombian from 1998, you know, eight feet, yeah. and he fed it rabbits kind of thing. Right. And that was just not what I was wanting to work with. But we bought this group of six Sonoran boas. I kept the largest pair. He kept a pair. I think one died, and we sold one other. And mine bred a year or two later and produced anarthristics in the litter. Wow. So the first, and I think the only anarthristic Sonorans, um, thankfully I'm now doing stuff with those again, but they're a remarkable anarthristic because they're very like the black-eyed anarthristics we see in Nicaragua, but they don't have black eyes. But we'll not talk about morphs tonight. I think we're going to do another show on locality yeah. more stuff yeah. later on. But that pulled me into the loving these boas, these small boas. And, you know, to then be able to work on a project later on that resulted in that, what we thought was boa imperator then being pulled out as boa sigma was kind of cool. 
you know. So they're they're just a neat species. I find them as adult. Mine tend to be about five feet for females, about three and a half for males on my feeding schedule. Um, and they're not aggressive. They come in a variety of color morphs or pattern morphs if you want localities. And also they're interesting for, for care and for breeding because they are a species that I find you need to get cool to have a lot of success with. You know, they're a desert boa. So, uh, you know, I've read reports where they find them in groups uh, at night at temperatures in the mid fifties. Wow. You know, I would drop mine down to like the low seventies, but 72 and I get, you know, really good success with those. But these are interesting because they're small boas, but they produce large litters of babies. Hmm. You know, I've got I've got leopard boas and I've got sonoran boas that might be four feet, and they'll produce 25 babies. Wow. And you pick up a baby sonoran boa and you hold it beside a baby Colombian boa, and it's just, you know, you could fit five of these little sonoran boas inside that Colombian. It's just ridiculous. Do they start fairly easy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, they, you know, I just start, you know, with all my boas, um, I start them on live. Years ago, I didn't. I would just sit and tease feed them. Um, but now, I just with the number of animals and with a, a family and a life, you know, yeah. I, throwing in a live hopper mouse and it's gone the next right. morning or, or later on that evening. I just find it easier for the first meal or two. Right. But they're, they're a really cool um, species that if people are interested in wanting a smaller boa. Um, you get cool different localities. You get varieties. You get the Tarahumaro. You get... Um, you know, these different smaller um, uh, localities within Sigma as well. Do they and tend to be a ter terrestrial boa or an arboreal boa? I find them to be terrestrial. Uh -huh. um, and I've, I've kept them in a variety of different enclosures. Um, they tend to be heavier bodied, right? So, um, you know, I've also got some of the island boas, like the West Snake Key and Crawl Key and so on. And they're much smaller and their body plan is slightly different. They're almost more arboreal. Mm -hmm. And they'll stay arboreal. Um, for my Sonorans, um, I've I've never found them to be that interested in moving into trees. Um, the females, you know, they have that kind of. I've always described their perfect body plan as like a loaf of bread, you know, flat sided. They're not this bulbous kind of flat tire that we used to think of, of boa, a Colombian boas. Uh, but they they don't seem to have the body plan for trees. Now other people might 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 view that differently and see their their boas as being arboreal, but as a result of keeping them in those different enclosures, like I used when I first kept them, I kept them in four foot by two foot by two foot melamine enclosures with branches and so on, and they were just always on the floor. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as a result, that meant that I didn't feel bad moving them into freedom breeder type tubs whenever I moved here. You know, the, I keep the females in like freedom breeder 90s, which is like the, I don't know what they are, like the 80 something or the ARS. Right. Um, you know, it's just a little bit wider than the 70, a little bit deeper. Um, and I keep my males in, in, in CB70s, and they seem to thrive. Well, I, I think an advantage to somebody like you that has so many locality boas, too, you can kind of compare the species in captivity and see the differences in them on what they're doing in the cages and then kind of tailor those cages to that species, which is yeah, right. pretty you know, cool. Yeah, because you know, I've made a move. You know, I also keep a lot of corrales, and I've got a lot of cages for those. You know, So every so often there's an empty one, I've moved animals into it. To see what happens, and um, and you know the the small island boas go up in the trees, and the and the Sonoran Desert stuff, and the Costa Ricans stay down low. That's cool. Males are different because they're smaller; they sometimes go a little bit, but they they tend to come back down again pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the boa sigma is just a it's a species that was only recognized just a couple of years ago. Um, a few years prior to our paper that came out, there was a paper by a, a friend of mine, Frank Burbrink, um, who is the Curator of Reptiles at the um, Museum of American Museum of Natural History in New York. Is that the right one? Sure. Um, and he's also a, a professor. Does a lot of work on snake genomics. But he was involved in a study of, of boas, and they recognized a lineage that was distinct from on the Pacific Coast and those who were on the Gulf Coast. And we followed that up. Uh, I was a co-author on a paper with a, a PhD student um, down in, in uh, University of Texas Arlington called Darren Card. And uh, Darren did uh, a more in-depth genetic profile of them, and, and we resurrected the uh, Pacific Coast boas as boa sigma. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's only in the last couple of years that that's really come out. Um, as we move to the um, Gulf Coast, that's whenever we get the 
other Mexican boas, the, the Yucatan, the um, Veracruz. Um, and interestingly, you know, you've got Cozumel. Like Cozumel is an island that didn't have boas. And there's a, I don't know if you guys know the story behind it. Um, years ago, I remember watching um, a show on National Geographic with um, Jesus Rivas, um, who's a professor in, um, in New Mexico, I think in Las Cruces, New Mexico. He's a friend of mine, works on anacondas. Um, but he was doing this show on National Geographic where they were on Cozumel to investigate the boa constrictor population. It was introduced and it was devastating bird and small mammal populations there to the point that he said you go into the forest in, in Cozumel and it was silent because the birds had been engulfed and eaten by, by these boas. Wow. So I, I emailed him at this point in time. I was a postdoc in North Carolina, developed markers where we could study the genetics of boas. And I emailed him and said, look, if you guys get samples, it would be really neat to look at the population genetics of these here to see how they, you know, was it a small number of founders or were they consistently introduced and so on, where did they come from? And I heard nothing. And then I got married and my wife and I were on a cruise and one of the stops was Cozumel. Hmm. We went through Cozumel and got straight on to a, um, <laughs> a boat, went on to mainland Mexico to Tulum. That's came back that day. I'm sitting on the back of the boat drinking some cocktail out of a coconut, you know. And I pulled out my computer, much to my wife's annoyance, and I was checking emails, the joys of academia. And I got an email from a group in Cozumel that was working on the boas. Wow. And they said, if you're ever in Cozumel, let us know. <laughs> and I took a picture of the boat as we were pulling away from it. But I, I, we, we set up a collaboration uh, and we used the genetic markers to test these populations. And we found out that they were two separate introductions. So there's, a, there's an east coast and a west coast. And these populations, there were large populations now, but they were fusing in the center. And when we do more work to, to understand what's happening there, it turned out that it was a, a movie was filmed there in the 70s. And they brought animals over from mainland Mexico. Oh, my God. From Yucatan. And this, the animal handler, so they drape them on trees. So you actually find, I, I need to find the, the name of it again. I think it's in the paper that we published. You might find it on my website. Uh, you can see like them draped in the background on the, on the trees. You know, just like if you watch Indiana Jones or, or even Star Wars, right? You'll yeah. see the odd boat quicker popping up. So he left them there, or they, they had them there. And then instead of collecting them and bringing them back again, he just left them. Wow. And from those two small, because we're filming on one side of the island and filming on the other, and from those group of animals, I think we worked it out how, how many it was. It was a small number on each side. That formed the population that now have became so large. And the weird thing about it is controlling them is difficult because they're a CITES protected species. Wow. It brings up all this controversy about whether you kill it or whether you don't. Um, so that happened on, on Cozumel. It's also happened on Puerto Rico. It's happened on Aruba. Where you see an introduction, Aruba is interesting because you've got both boa imperator and boa constrictor introduced. So you get these introductions on the islands that they shouldn't be on. You know, with Cozumel, you might think, well, it's so close to mainland Mexico, we should see them. But that channel between there is so deep that it doesn't permit them, them rafting. Gotcha. But, you know, it's just a crazy story for, for that is. That is crazy. And we did it. Um, but, you know, from, from that imperator group in Mexico, they work their way down through Central America, which is kind of cool. And and for me, they form the basis, other than Sigma, of the of the species that I'm really passionate about. I hate you. Well, you know, people don't like that term passionate, right? I'm, I think they're awesome. It's, it's why I got into other species but as well. But you've got, you know, going from like Yucatan and Veracruz, you then go into Belize. And the Belize boas are neat because you look at these, right, and they're all connected. It's not very far, but you start to see locality variation existing. And these little small islands popping up and seeing cool traits appearing here and there. And they form the basis of the dwarf boas that we have, or what we call the Central American boas in captivity. You know, you've got Belize and mainland Belize boas are interesting, but the ones that are really interesting are the islands. Right? You've got Coral, Coral Key, Cocker Key, Ambergus Key, West Snake Key, all of those ones. And they're tiny little boas. Like they are stupidly small and small litters. And the cool thing about them is um, they oh, – oh, yeah, I'll get back to that. Um, uh, Rob just reminded me of one thing as well. We're going to get to that once we go into, into Nicaragua because those blue fields are Nicaragua. Um, 
the cool thing about those dwarf boas is they've evolved on islands where rodent populations aren't large, and what they're eating are migratory birds, migratory passerines. So they're coming in for a very short period of the year. These little boas are, are going into the trees and feasting on them and then starving for the rest of the year. And maybe lizards here and there, but nutritionally not something that's going to grow them big. So these are tiny little boas, and you even find size variation between uh, between the islands that it seems to be based on the size of the island. Another really cool thing that's been done is there was a study on these island boas where they looked at morphology and they looked at the head structure, and you find the head structure varies between the mainland boas and each of the different islands. So their heads are slightly different. Some are more squat and short. Some are more elongated and thin. Yeah, yeah. And these also be tied into their diet which is just really really cool definitely a, a group of boas that are that are um we don't see a lot in the hobby um i think with people becoming more interested in in localities we're starting to see them come up more often but the problem is they produce small litters right so therefore you're not going to see the big numbers occurring right uh, and the other is that scary- a bad thing is that a bad thing though well, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> the other thing that is bad is they're from such a small founding population. Right. So genetically, right. they're really inbred. Now, that can be a good thing, right? We think of inbreeding as being bad, right? Inbreeding is not necessarily bad because what inbreeding can do is it can result in the fixation of genetic traits that are beneficial and the purging of genetic traits that are deleterious. Right. Right. We see, we see this commonly, right? My lab is all based on, on how animals adapt and evolve in urban environments. And we use urban pest insects as model systems, many things like bed bugs and cockroaches and stuff like that. Bed bugs are one of the most widely dispersed indoor pests in the world, genetically really diverse across the world. Within a single infestation, if you're unlucky to have them in your house, they could start from a female who's gravid and they just inbreed and inbreed and inbreed. They are genetically depauperate, firstly, homozygous across their genome it's ridiculous and it's because they're purging these de- deleterious alleles and that means they're fixed that genetic the genetic information they're carrying in their genes is perfectly adapted to that environment mm-hmm. uh, that can also be detrimental because what can happen is we can see mutations accruing over time which can knock out the benefits of some of those thankfully with it, if we have a large number of people breeding them you know that we can eliminate that a little bit right. but you know, inbreeding is not necessarily bad. I don't recommend it in humans, uh, but <laughs> well, not, a, uh, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, um, I wouldn't if, if you can if you can have the opportunity to outbreed. Um, I would. Um, you know, I can get back to this later on. You know, I find it kind of um, concerning that people are like with Hog Islands; they only want to breed Sears to Sears line, right? Lemke to Lemke line, right. or Shoe to it line. And I don't think whenever we have these other lines, I think we should be benefiting from those. Yeah. yeah. You can selectively breed for speckles or non or whatever, but I think we should outbreed when you can. Agreed. With these small island boas, you don't have the chance. You know, we've got a small funding population and and that's it. And in fact, a friend of mine that actually collected many of these boas that I've got so many of my island boas from has said that, you know, you'll see after a short number of generations, weird things happening with pattern. Uh, you'll get weird, crazy patterns appearing and so on, again, due to inbreeding. Right. You know, I think it's been shown that it only takes about six generations before you start seeing phenotypic traits appearing in animals that are that are mutations based uh, that have arisen within that that line. Mm. Uh, but those, you know, those Belize boas. Whenever we, we don't see many Belize boas in captivity, mainland Belize, but we see the islands. We see right. the key, which are kind of cool. But from there, and the other thing, cool thing about them is they're not just small. They're kind of strange looking in that their their patterns can be slightly different. I was going to bring that up. Their pattern and, and, and color pattern. Yeah. Also, they're very anarthristic. Right. You know, the cocker key and the crawl key, especially, are really anarthristic, which is kind of cool. Again, perfectly adapted to their environment. You know, and I'd love to go out to some of those those keys to actually look at the 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 um, habitat that they're in. Are you seeing like a lot of rock, and therefore right. that dark pattern is helping blend them against it? So on. You know, at some point in time, I'll. I'll try and get out to some of these islands, but they're a really unusual looking little snake, which is kind of cool because, you know, for somebody that's got an apartment and would love to have a boa, but they can't have a six foot boa. You can have a, one of these key boas in a small enclosure, you know, two foot or by two foot tall or whatever. Some of these little um, more arboreal enclosures and they'll thrive in those, which is right. fantastic. Yeah, that's cool. 
And from there, you then go to Honduras. And Honduras is neat because you get the mainland boas, which are kind of dark. Um, the interesting thing about Honduras, boas, I think, from Honduras haven't been imported since the late 80s, I think. Maybe Rob would know that there, but I don't think they're, they have been brought in. There's been a number of illegal imports that came in relating to Hog Islands, the Chaos Coquinas Islands. But um, from mainland Honduras and from the Chaos Coquinas Islands, we haven't, or any of the Bay Islands that that's part of, we haven't seen legal imports coming in in a long time. But the ones that we all know from Honduras are the Hog Island boas, which we just talked about a minute ago. But just, you know, again, what's neat, I should, I've got a thesis up on my shelf from a student in England that studied the Bay Island boas, and you look at the different islands, the main one being the Chaos Coquinas, major and minor, um, where we find the Hog Island boas occurring. But you look at some of the other islands and you'll, the boas there look different. They don't look like Hog Island boas. And that's just because of the founder effect, the animals that got there. And over time, you know, they could be darker or lighter and so on. And you see very different phenotypic um, traits in those boas. But the Hog Islands, I think, are just spectacular. Yeah. Sandy colored, you know, naturally hypomelanistic. So you've had selection for um, hypomelanism and you've had that trait fixed. Right. And that's it. You don't find a dark um, hog island boa. Um, they almost went extinct on the island because the collection was so extensive between the late 70s and the mid 80s that um, I believe it was National Geographic went there in the early 90s and couldn't find a boa. I've got friends that have gone there uh, that have worked on on the hog island boas that whenever they were there, they were finding about um, a four every every hour or two. Um and, and they were finding them in the trees, and they sent pictures back to me. And they're, you know, it's exactly what we think of as a hog island. You know, hog islands in captivity are are slightly different than what we tend to see on the island now because of maybe selection due to what was collected. But you know, we see lines that are really reduced pattern. So, for example, one of my hog island males is striped instead of instead of having the, the standard um, bands. Um, some of them are heavily speckled. Some of them are, are not. Some of them, the, the tail is almost pink, and some of them are more orange, and, and, and so on. So there's a lot of variation, even among the uh, the animals. You know, so my animals are from from the Shewitt line and from the Sears line, and the striped one is is from a line that was maintained in uh, University of um, Arkansas by a keeper there, and they just had it for for twenty or thirty years, um, and they bred them and they sold them. So it's a cool striped boa. I've got some Very pictures cool. on the Instagram page. Um, but they then they would they stopped bringing them in in the mid '80s, and you know we saw the the trend in them. Kind of people started breeding them into Colombian boas, and you lost the purity. Yeah. I think it's still very easy to identify a hog island boa. Um, you know, if you're into boas, they're night and day different than a Colombian or wherever else. You know, um, but a, a illegal imports came in in 2004, 2005. They were they were they were brought in. I think it was 30 or 40 animals, and then they were distri distributed to a zoo, I think. Um, I know some people that have got some animals from that. Um, but, the, but the island's rebounded, and the, the Hog Island boas are back on Hog Island, you know, so it's kind of cool. Hey, Warren, uh, just to inter interrupt you real quick, do you notice a little bit of a different head structure on the Hog Island, too? Because I, I seem to see definitely, like, a, a different structure around the nose, I I'm going to say, than, than the other. Oh, is that I keep? Yeah, thinking about it, I think the head's more elongated. Yeah. Narrower. Right. Um, definitely compared to the Sonoran bows, the Sigma that I've got, and 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 even to the other, the, the key bows that I've got. But, yeah, I would, I would definitely see a more slender head. Now, part of that could be because it's lighter, right? So it's actually just a an optical illusion, right? right. It's that lighter color. The, the, the banding is slightly different. Mm -hmm. But I do see some, you know, you look, you look at across all bow imperator, you'll see head variation. Right. But I think I think hogs definitely do have a slight variation in their look. Right. I, I remember going back to my friend Clive Osborne's collection. That's where I saw the first kind of real hogs that just blew my mind. This would have been in like 1997 or so. At night, we went in. Um, he had this two, three car garage that he converted, underfloor heating, and all the cages had no sub, no additional heating with mesh fronts. And he had these hog islands there in these kind of tubs. And we went in at midnight. He had a beer fridge, which was excellent. So we went in to drink beer in his sweat box of a, of a garage. <laughs> his hog islands were milk white and pink. Yeah. 
just incredible. You know, so you haven't mentioned many of these boas change color between night and day. Right. Hog Islands are, are great examples of that. Absolutely. You know, they can they can really fool you in terms of, you know, they, they, they look like totally different animals between night and day. But then there's even a T positive line of, of Hog Islands, which are really cool as well. Very subtle, mm -hmm. but really interesting because the blacks are, are replaced with purples. Wow. And they're really neat. So uh, very, very cool animals. Um, you know, and then even in Honduras, we've got um, Roatan. So, again, if you've been on a cruise, <laughs> many of the stops will be in Roatan. Not the safest of places, I believe. But they got a cool line of boas as well. Because if you've heard of the fire belly boas, and these were kind of somewhat popular in the early 2000s, um, small boas, orange-red bellies, really, really cool. Um, I haven't seen them in a while. It was it was Dennis Sergent that had them in like the early or mid nineties, but I haven't seen any really pop up in the last five or ten years. That I would say, you know, yeah, that's a fire belly. Mm -hmm. It might be more in Europe, um, but I haven't really seen any in the U.S. That you know, people will advertise them as it, but we know if people advertise anything, they right. had a you know an extra zero under the price. But um, yeah, they're. They're a small kind of red-bellied boa, which is kind of cool. And what's neat about that is that we then think about where that leads into, and we're then going into like El Salvador, and many of the El Salvador boas have got orangey kind of red bellies, so it fits perfectly with the geographic kind of spread. Mm -hmm. and, and they're neat, again, because they're a small boa. You know, you see true El Salvadors, again, four and a half foot for an adult female, smaller for the males, and they became popular because that's where we got the blood boa from. You know, Ron St. Pierre picked that up out of a shipment and um, along with one that he thought, I think he said he thought one was like a T-positive albino and he thought one was anarthristic and so on. There was a lot of variations of these little animals coming in. But, you know, he bred the bloods. So the story behind that is really cool and it's been told elsewhere, you know, about nobody wanting them and then he, I think he got out of them and then, then he started seeing them at Daytona with absurd prices. Right. They're a, they're a neat little boa, again, small. I, I've got some El Salvador blood boas and they're tiny you know they're not big um and and then we go to nicaragua and, and and if you think central american boas 99 percent of your central american boas pop out of nicaragua right so in the in the 80s and the 90s i think they were they were exporting you know 10 or 11 thousand a year at times out of, out of nicaragua which is just remarkable that they were exporting that number of animals across the world and of course as a result of that you started seeing anarchistics yeah i remember seeing the first tea positives i don't know if you guys remember that ben siegel had them advertised on his site for like fifteen thousand each and yeah jeremy stone and, and tom burke got them uh and you started seeing this whole diversity of animals popping out of there so whenever we think tea positive central america is nicaragua, nicaragua. type 2 anarchistic is nicaragua all that kind of stuff and again, small boas, you know, they're, they're slightly bigger than, than the other ones further north. You know, they maybe five feet for a female, maybe five and a half feet, but still a, a great animal. And, and if, you know, sadly, uh, very many of the Central American boas we see now are, uh, are, inter are integrated between localities. You know, Nicaraguans bred into El Salvador, bred into Panamanians and so on. But you can still get pure Nicaraguan boas and some really neat neat things you know they're a darker smaller boa um, some people say they're nippy i don't i don't believe so i think it's just people's excuse and then again i'm not a person that needs to pick up snakes and dance around with them so right. they can bite all they want you know so nicks are great but um the thing for nicaragua two animals or two localities came out as being really cool rob mentioned one in a in a in an envelope that he just hand wrote and stuck up in his <laughs> we feel boas Right, so um, who was it brought in the Bluefield Boas? Um, or who worked with them? I'm trying to remember. Somebody worked with them kind of extensively. Ron Tramper, Tramper had Boas. started that out. That's it. And I remember seeing those advertised. Um, I was, I can't remember whether I was, I was, I think I was in Ireland at the time, so I couldn't, there was no chance of me getting them. And again, that's a line that we don't see. The Bluefield Boas kind of disappeared, but because I think that they weren't phenotypically very different. They were a bit lighter. Um, so people just kind of like, you know, localities weren't a big deal then. And we kind of lost them. But the one that's cool from that, in my opinion, are the Corn Island boas. The kind of 
Island de Maze kind of animals. And I, these are another animal that I remember seeing the first groups coming in. So they were exported. Um, you had two farmed litters that were exported. I think it was about 20 babies, 21 babies out of those two litters. They were exported from the Corn Island in 19, I think it was 95 or 96. And these are just phenotypically different. You know, they're lighter, the, the tails are more orange, just something about them, and they're small. And I saw a group that came into Europe, because my friend Clive Osborne had some, and then they went through Europe and they were sold to other people. And then I think Vin Russo and Gus Renfro might have got um, groups here in the US. And again, a, a bow you don't see often, but they're, they're phenotypically different. And something that's cool that's popped up from them is there's an anarchistic line, which is kind of neat. Um, I keep trying to get them. I've got a friend who breeds them and we keep kind of missing each other in terms of whenever he's got babies, whenever I've got babies, because I'm not buying them. We're trading them. Right. You know? Um, but one thing that he says about those corn islands is that they, they're really big for rubbing their nose. And I'm curious whether they're more of an arboreal snake. You know, if we actually put them up in arboreal cages, will they kind of roam more? And when I get corn islands, that's, I, I think I plan to set them up like that just to see. Yeah. Um, they're, they're remarkable, and I wish we could see more of those. Um, but, you know, it's just one of those sort of things. Hopefully we will soon. And then from Nicaragua, you go into Costa Rica. And again, phenotypically different than Nicaraguan. Um, more similar in look to Panamanian, but again, they were, they were only brought in legally in the early 2000s. I remember seeing the posts on, uh, it might have been kingsnake.com or one of those ones, where it was like 2004, 2005, and they brought in um, animals from uh, Liberia that were that were bred in, in a zoo in uh, in Costa Rica, not not Quetzal Zoo, but in another one. Um, and they brought in two litters, I think it was two or three litters of animals, and uh, and they made up the the main group. I think another group came in a year or two later. They said they were kind of unknown locality, but people apply a name to them. But they they're really different. So I, I work with Costa Rican boas quite extensively. And body plan, they're like Sonora and they're like Sigma. Color-wise, they're really interesting because the sides of them are almost steel gray blue. Um, and the head, the face on them is just really strange. I need to post pictures on my on my Instagram. The the color is just so dramatically different. And 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 mine stay small. I mentioned, you know, earlier that there's a picture of like an enormous one that was pulled out of the forest not that long ago. You know, I can understand an old animal getting that big if it's got the right diet. But they're just a cool snake. You know, they're, mine tend to be small. The males, again, like three and a half feet, four feet. Females, about four and a half feet, five feet. Um, and they're just a really fun little snake, you know. And then from there, you go into Panama. And Panama is where we saw the hypo. So if you think salmon boa and you think oh, the Jeff Geeline orange tail, that's Panama. That's where they came from. If you think about the Central American motley, that's where it came from. You know, they came out of Panama. Um, so all of you people that have got your Colombian boas and your hypos, they're Central American, Colombian, <laughs> right? They're imperator still, but they're, they were small boas bred into those. And, um, and they're a great snake. If you look at the wild type ones, the darker ones, they're very similar to Costa Rican boas because they're so close. You know, like where we find boas, you know, I go to Costa Rica nearly every year. And the imperator that we find are... 20 kilometers from the Nicaraguan border, you know, and, you know, we've argued, we've talked about this before with other people that, you know, snakes don't see geographic boundaries or borders. They look at geographic boundaries, like, you know, major rivers or boundaries of- and so on. Right. So if we looked at these animals, they're going to be a climb going from locality to locality and so on. And then due to our inbreeding of animals from that area, you're going to fix for kind of traits that are more locality kind of associated, but the Panamanians are really good. And, and again, it was around the same time that the, um, that a, I think it was a group from Costa Rica came in about 2004, 2005, that we saw a group come in from Panama again, which was had like, you know, I want to say like 25 hypos and striped hypos and about 25 or 30 wild type. And that set up kind of a large group of animals that people were then kind of capture breeding. Um, and again, that's kind of dispersed a bit. You know, we don't see very many of them. Even the true Costa Ricans, we don't see very many people breeding them now. And then from from Panama, 
we then have the really the first subspecies that we can talk about, which is sabogai or sabogi, depending on the way you want to pronounce it, the Pearl Island boas. Um, I think they were first named in like 1905 or something like that there. As I think, I think they were named as like epicrate sabogai, right? So the, what we see is the, the Brazilian rainbows, right? They were yeah. under that the genus. And then they were changed to like constrictor, constrictor sabogai, and then eventually boa constrictor or boa imperator sabogai. And they are cool because, again, they're a naturally occurring hypomelanistic animal. Pattern's different. Their eyes are brown. So you can tell a true sabo guy by his eyes alone, basically. Um, I remember my, my friend, Rich Isle, Rich Isle um, from Salmon Boa. Um, he bred um, Pearl Island Boas. I kept them pure, and they were a neat little animal. I've been offered them. I, I've seen them, started seeing them again in the last year or two, and I've been offered some in trade. And I, I keep thinking about getting them. You know, they're, cause again, I... They're neat to look at, but they're also a, a subspecies that I don't want to see dying out. You know, I, I fear we almost lost Dunn's pythons. We almost lost right. a bunch of different species for people getting bored of them. Um, we've lost Nebulosa and Orophius essentially because people thought they were ugly. Right. And, um, and, and I would hate to see that happening with some of these animals that we have in our grasps, you know. Um, off the Pearl Island, you've also got... Um, Toboga Island, which is another hypomelanistic. They're really, I think those islands are really close to each other. Um, and I think some people were kind of just crossing Toboga into, into Pearl Islands, but they look very, they're again a phenotypically different snake and thinner, smaller bodied, um, tend to like arboreal kind of enclosures. It's very, very cool. And hey, Warren, what was it about the eyes that uh, I, I missed that part? They're, they're brown. They're brown in color. Okay. Um, so if you pick up a, a true Pearl Island, it's got like brown eyes. Gotcha. Um, which are kind of neat. You know, they're um, they're really cool. You know, and uh, and that's really the Central American boas. You know, going from from boa imperator in that case, going from and, you know Yucatan and so on, and, and Veracruz and Mexico all the way down to Panama. I think that's an incredible range. And if if we were to take pictures of all of those, you can see the transitions as they move. You see phenotypic variation as you go through them. And you see these multiple occurrences of islands and boas getting onto islands and evolving on those islands and, and evolving those traits independently. So the dwarf tiny boas that you find on all those keys off Belize and so on and, and, and off Panama and, and off Nicaragua have all evolved that small size independently mm. um, because of their diet, which is kind of neat, you know, really, really cool snakes. And then you get into the into the kind of the bigger ones, right? You get into, into South America, you get Colombia, you get Venezuela, and that's where we see the the the, um, the boa imperator getting big, right? You know, I think you know, just as we've done, we being the general herb community, you know, we've overfed our snakes for many years. So you would see big ass Colombians, big ass Venezuelan boas, you know, that were massively obese and and eight feet long. Yeah. I think we're starting to see them. They don't need to be that big, you know, and I'm starting to see more that are like the six and a half feet, kind of six feet length in breeding and producing healthy litters. Right. You know, but again, the Colombians, just like Nicaragua for Central Americans, Colombia was like the epicenter for, um, for export for Boa Imperator. And that was our, our bigger animals that we would see, you know, and, and we've seen a bunch of them come from there. And as a result of that, you know, a, a bunch of different color and pattern morphs that were isn't. So, um, you know, where I'm much more interested in the smaller kind of Central American boas, you, you look through Instagram and Facebook and, and, the, and the Internet, and you'll find people that are just enamored with those kind of bigger boas. Yeah. Uh, very, very cool animals. You know, listening to you go through all these localities and species and whatnot, and I'm a child of the 60s and 70s, and I often wonder what animals I actually did have in my possession back then because, oh, yeah. you know, I was keeping boas yeah. from day one, you know? So, you know, I'm trying to think back as you're talking to all the different animals that I can still kind of remember and say, man, that could have been that or that could have been know. this, you know? Right. You know, because yeah. they weren't advertised as, you know, no. as boa constrictor or your boa imperator or whatever. Exactly. Or boa super imperator back then. But, you know, it's funny because I, just when I was driving from my house to my lab where, where I am now, I, um, I was thinking about the first time I saw, you know, boas that had been bred in captivity, and that was my friend Jonathan. And he had this female that he called Orlith, and she was like eight feet long, and he fed her rabbits. She was a behemoth. And the male that he used, he called Samson, and he was like four feet long. It's like this little worm. 
Yeah. And I was like, that's an amazing variation. And, you know, this, this time I'm a biology student and I'm like a genetics kind of major. And I'm like, this is just remarkable variation. Of course, later on, I realized that's a Nicaraguan male. Right. And that's a, you know, a Colombian female. Right. It all makes sense now as I got more into boas. But right. again, it's just exactly what happened. You know, so if we look at um, animals that are in captivity now that have been bred for many years, like Colum- what we label as Colombians, there's probably a lot of Nicaraguan blood in those as right. well. Especially once we get into the, you know, this one's hypomelanistic. Well, that came from Panama. We know that. The, we know that, right? So therefore, it's got a certain amount of Central American kind of bloodline in it, you know. Um, but I totally agree with you. It's like where did the where where were those animals coming from? And yeah. What did you actually have at the time, yeah. you know? Yeah. You know, me being a biologist, I have a horrible habit of keeping any animal that dies in a freezer. You know, so, and I think many herpetologists do the same thing. Herpetoculturists do the same thing. I hate to imagine what's lurking in freezers from the 1980s. <laughs> but it would, it would imagine it'd be pretty interesting to take, to delve into those really deep and find out what you're right. getting. You know? oh, yeah. probably some things there, you know. Absolutely. Probably have some cool genetic studies done on that there. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the, uh, the Imprat are kind of cool. They, um, uh, we also see, um, the uh, boa, um, the Peruvian long tails, so they're Imperator longicauda, um, and they are, uh, I think, found on the on the Pacific side of Peru. Really interesting snake. Um, Vin Russo and his brother brought them into into the hobby, uh, and they're a really different snake. Have you ever kept longicauda, or do you keep longicauda? I don't now, but I ha- I've ha- I've had one animal in the past. And I got it because at the time it was in Daytona or it might have been Orlando still. And maybe it was even Vin or his brother. I don't know. But they were saying how these animals can get this blue head. Yeah. Um, and that's when I was like, oh, I got to get at least one. And, you know, that's when you just wanted one of everything. And I had gotten one animal to, to grow up, but I never got a pair. I never. Uh, you know, I stupidly, stupidly, I had a pair. And, of course, I, I sold them. And I think it was just whenever I was just before I was moving from North Carolina to, to Oklahoma. And I thought, you know, I need to pare down the collection a little bit. So I sold my longer cotter that I'd had for like three or four years and raised up. And I sold a captive bred pair of Guyana boas, which were just remarkable. To, I don't know, to the same guy in California. I wish I could find that email with his name because I'd love to get them back. But they were <laughs> cool because, you know, when they're born, they're just normal drab looking little boas. Of course, they're called longer cotta, so it's got a long tail. So you flip them over, and they got a really long tail, right. um, which might suggest some arboreality to them. But they don't get big. You know, they get like four and a half feet. But the color is just weird. My, mine, you know, you think about these IMG boas that get dark. Every shed, these little boas just add dark pigmentation, and they yeah. were just highly iridescent. They got that kind of steel gray blue color to them. Yeah. Man, they were just out of this world and I'm I kick myself about it and I keep looking on morph market and I see them and I'm like, Oh, I should get another pair. Yeah. And this is the part of trying to downsize a collection and I keep looking at these thinking, Well, I should just put just one pair and then it's like but they've got the anarthristic, so I can get one pair of those and then it and then it all just goes crazy again. I I am gonna butcher her name, but uh Alison Thuce Thies? Yeah, she's got some remarkable She's got animals. some amazing animals, yeah. yeah. I, she's in Texas, I think, right? Yeah, she's, um, but she's yeah. produced some really nice ones. Yeah, I, I, I keep looking at those thinking I really need to, I really need to get some of those again. I will once we move back to once we move to Virginia. Um, I'm gonna at some point pick up a, a pair or a tree or something like that, just to yeah. work in another species that I don't want to see kind of disappearing because in the hobby, you know, we know that it goes and swings and roundabouts. You right. know, one year Brazilian rainbow boas are the hot thing, and for the next three years nobody cares about them. Just like right. Dumeril's boas. Do. You find you know people losing interest in them. It'd be nice just to maintain a group where you know they're you're maintaining a genetic lineage, you know, yeah. and some level of diversity, you know. But yeah, so those are definitely a, a species that I think is fantastic. There's there's Boa imperator ortoni, um, which again are phenotypically very different. I think they're more kind of northwestern Peru. I couldn't tell you a lot about them because I don't think I've ever seen them in captivity. And in fact, a number of years ago, I was contacted by an individual who put me into contact with a zoo there that were interested in trying to bring some over for scientific research, and we weren't able to we weren't able to get it together. 
But there again, another different looking boa. You know, again, when you've got a very wide ranging species, you get a lot of phenotypic variation across that cline, across that range. But from there, you know, realistically, we move into into constrictor constrictor. So when you hear red tail boa, it's boa constrictor constrictor, and those. You know, it's funny whenever people like post on Facebook, it's like, what do I have? You know, is it a red tail or is it a red tail boa is true constrictor or night and day different than a right. Colombian boa imperat or night and day different than a, than a boa sigma. Really pretty animals, again, with a wide range. But, you know, we think about the ones that are in, in the hobby, it's going to be um, Guyana and Suriname. Right. And, you know, people will advertise there as a Suriname or Guyana. Genetically, the work that's been done on them shows that there's not a lot of variation between them, and and you couldn't necessarily pick out one from the other. Now, as we increase resolution of genetic markers, we might, we might be able to say geographically they are, you know, more Suriname than Guyana or so on. But right now, with the markers that we've used, they they're kind of just one group, um, but a very pretty group. And again, different to keep from Imperata and different from Sigma. Um, slightly cooler is better. They don't like big meals. And these are the ones that are interesting, you know, because people think that they're the big kind of snakes. Yeah, they can get big, right? As I mentioned earlier, that picture of the Tommy Crossfield pissed up with that monster that was brought in yeah. you know, years ago, 30 years ago. But they, um, the, the most of the healthy ones that I see that are breeding are like seven feet, seven and a half feet. They're not big. Um, they just can't handle overfeeding. You know, no, they, sure. they just regurgitate, not in the same way that animals get into that regurgitation syndrome, but... They regurgitate big meals, and as a result, it does the same thing to the stomach lining. It thickens the stomach lining, and therefore they can't produce gastric juices that, that digest the meal, and therefore they die from it. Right. But I've seen very small ones. We, a friend of mine, had got a, a small group of, of animals that came off one of the islands um, in the uh, on the Amazon River, and um, and they were tiny. They were like four feet as adult. Really pretty little snakes. Um, they're as I say, you keep them cooler, feed them smaller, and they're on a different kind of cycle for breeding than, than Imperator and Sigma. Um, and they're not, I'm not seeing them commonly bred in captivity. They're still being brought in in fair numbers from the wild, sadly, and a lot of them don't do very well. But there's not a lot of people that seem to be breeding them consistently, which is a pity. You, know, you, do, you keep, or do you keep them now, or do you, have yeah. you kept them? Yeah, I, I have uh, Guyana and Suriname right now. Uh, I don't know if you're friends with Matt Turner on Facebook. I know the, I know, I know he just name. produced a beautiful litter of Surinams, a very spectacular. The whole oh, litter cool. is showstoppers. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy that I got mine from. He disappe- disappeared out of the hobby. He was big into photography, but he had this litter from a female that he called Rose. It was like Rose line animals. So that's what I had. Mm-hmm. These things, oh, just spectacular. The pinks and the purples and the yeah. tails are and my females the like that you know the saddles are neat because you get that kind of like the peaking and the, the widow's peaks in the saddles yeah. yeah you know and um and those widow's peaks if you see a snake with widow's peaks in the saddles you know that it's it's a constrictor line it's not a imperator right you know you only find those in, in constrictor constrictor and i find the head structure like very very different. pleasing yeah it's very, yeah. i really love the head structure and I mean. kind of, yeah it's it's a just a really pretty snake um, yeah, and again, it's one that I would like to see more people working with. The sad thing is that you know, like much of the hobby, if it doesn't come in a color morph, then people don't want it. Yeah, you know, but those things don't need it. They're so pretty. Yeah, and and I will say there 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 have been several um, wild or farmed or wild caught albinos that have been brought in. In fact, there was two albinos that were brought in recently, and they're really neat because the tails. If you want to see red and, and white background, those things are vibrant. Um, they just haven't been able to um, cultivate those in captivity yet. Mm. Sad David Tracy Barker had one that looked like it had been bitten by eight million ticks. You know, it was all kind of mangy and scrubby. But um, there's another one in uh, another two that were brought in, and some possible heads from that from the litter that were brought in a couple of years ago um, into Florida. So hopefully, we'll see those popping. I remember up. seeing that. Yeah, I remember yeah, seeing those. Yeah, as an adult, and they look really good. Oh wow! Um, but with those, you've also got. Um, boa constrictor melanogaster, you know, the dark belly or the black belly boas. Again, um, genetically, I'm not sure how um, uh, valid that subspecies is. Um, I don't really see them in captivity. I saw them in Europe here and there. 
Um, but they they were they were a snake with a you know typical body plan of a constrictor constrictor, but a charcoal kind of belly, very very cool looking. Um, and then you've got Amarali, which I the short my tail. Favorite. It's oh, my favorite. Man, I love those. And again, stupidly, I I had them and I and I and I sold them, which was the, just insane. I don't know why I did that. You know, you think about the long tail bows for the longer cotta, then you get the short tails, which is the Amarali. They're like, they're almost like a blood python. That's why I like them. <laughs> they're, 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 yeah. you know, it's, they're, they're neat. And you've got some of those. I I, I think I have uh, 3.4 right now, yeah. Oh, you've got some of them. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're definitely my favorite. And they're not big. They don't no. they're maybe four feet, five feet. Yeah. yeah, they really are a blood python wearing the skin of a Yep, bone. absolutely. That's why I love them. Short, uh, man, I love those. And I think that's one that I definitely will will get back again. How do yeah. you keep yours? What kind of enclosures do you keep yours in? Um, the adults are in a in a, a, a twenty six by uh, forty eight, um, uh-huh. and I I don't provide any perches because I I've had perches in there. I don't see anything yeah. going on with them. They're obviously a very terrestrial snake, yeah. and uh, I just provide them with a nice tight hide. Um, and yeah, they do great. I, I mean, they got that different head structure too. It's very they really are. Yeah, short and blocky. Um, when they females, especially when they get large, they really get a really cool head. Yeah, yeah. I, I need to get some of those again. I, I stupid. You know, you, we've all done it. You know, in my near thirty years of keeping snakes, you've had these ones. And it's like, you know what? I'll sell these ones now, and I'll get them again in a year yeah. or two. And that never happens. You know, right. the, the prices skyrocket, or else yeah. don't see the bread. Like I, I had Duns pythons back twenty something years ago, and I sold them because they were boring. <laughs> and then they really disappeared from the hobby. Thankfully, I've got them again, which is kind of cool. But yeah. uh, I did the same thing with Amarali, which is just ridiculous. And well, I, ne- on Morph Market, I don't see them popping up very often. No. Next year, I think uh, I'll have two females ready to go. So if I'm lucky, I'll let you take a look at the litter first. Oh, yeah. They're wonderful. They're just, just, for me, out of the constrictor subspecies, that's the one. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's just epic. Yeah. yeah. Same with me. Yeah. And then you've got Occidentalis, the Argentine boas. Those things are just nuts. Have you? You've yeah. got you've got Occidentalis as well. Yeah, I have some uh, from Eugene Bassett's line, so yeah, they're real nice animals. But I, I would like to find a couple. I, I back in the day, I had some. I'm, the black and white for me is just oh, it. You know, if I, if you can get ones with a lot of white, and I see some people posting adult pictures that you know they got that one animal. If I could find uh, another pair that look like that, I would definitely pick them yeah. up in a heartbeat. Yeah, they're, they're the other one that I, that from my friend Clive Osborne's place, that's the other one that really stood out for me as being, holy shit, that's amazing. Because yeah. they were enormous. Like, yeah. They're the biggest animals I've seen. They were they were easily eight and a half, nine feet. Yeah. You know, you, you know obviously, uh, Paul Miles. Um, yeah. I went to visit Paul's place when he had bred the bull and I for the first time. And um, I walk in to look at the bull and I, and he had cages of uh, Argentine boas. And like, I was just blown away at the size and, you know, he was breeding them fairly consistently then. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was looking at them as much as the bull and I, and they were very impressive animals. Yeah. Big heads as well. Big chunky heads. Yeah. You know? Such a, such a really cool, I'm surprised they haven't been identified as a species. And, and again, I, they're one that I wouldn't be surprised if they get pulled out as being a full species. What I notice about the head structure on them is from the side profile, they're just so thick. Yeah, really right? deep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Compared to the boas. Very, very cool. You know, I, like I've seen a line, there's, there's like a high pink line that I've seen, and they're pretty impressive. Yeah. Of course, you've got the T-positive albina, which was thought to be uh, a hypomelanistic for many years, and then they realized it was a T-positive. You even got a motley. Right. Yeah. You know, very cool, underrepresented in the hobby. The sad thing about those is they're CITES one listed, so therefore you can't move them between the US and Europe and so on, uh, which makes it a problem for maintaining genetic lines and so right. on. But just a just a great species that I would love to see more people working with. I think it's because of the potential adult size that puts right. some people on them. You know, but again I don't think they need to be grown to that size. You know, I think that's just again we see them at that size, but that's because whenever they came in we fed things as much as we could feed right. them. Yeah. We thought that that was the best thing for them. They're interesting in that uh, I read an article um, not so long ago about them being found in the wild breeding, and they were breeding like anacondas, so it was uh, in water uh, and multiple males all wrapped around the female. Oh, wow. So you get that kind of group breeding. 
uh, which I thought was interesting. You know, you see that with green anacondas and yellow right. anacondas. Where yep. At a small part of the year, they all just, you know, on mass kind of move into these these kind of swamps and, and breed. So they're they're a really really cool um, subspecies for now. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they got pulled out as being a species. Yeah. And then that brings us to, for me, two super interesting subspecies recognized at the moment and very likely will get recognized as species and that is boa aurofius from St. Lucia and boa nebulosa or boa constrictor uh, aurofius and boa constrictor nebulosa the clouded boa from uh, Dominica oh (laughs) man I years ago um, at my friend Clive's house he had both of them now he his St. Lucia boas as a Rophius, he treated like everything else, you know, it doesn't matter. This, he put on gloves to hold these things because they're so rare. And at this point, I was much more into emerald tree boas and Amazon right. tree boas, and I just started getting into the snoring. So I was like, oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. Neat little boa, kind of looking at it just as a boa. And now I think back, and I was like, what did I have in my hands then? Yeah. They're, they're non-existent in captivity in the U.S., to my knowledge. Right. And, and even in Europe. There's only a small handful um, that, that still exists and that, that, that we know of. Uh, I think IBD took out a whole bunch of those um, and that destroyed a whole group there in Europe oh. as it did with boa constrictor nebulosa. And nebulosa looked different because they call it the clouded boa because it looks like the pattern is behind a cloud. It's all right. diffuse. And, and, I, and I, it's funny, I speak to some people in Europe about them that had them. And they're like, oh, I sold them because I, I didn't find them very interesting to look at. And it's like, oh. <laughs> I, I know <laughs> that's killing Rob because I know that's one of Rob's favorite species. I know of a pair in the U.S. and that's it. Yeah. A yep. single pair in the U.S. You yeah. probably know exactly yeah. what it is, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, And I would love to see babies from those. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, man, what a, what a great, great species. And they, interestingly, the ones that my friend Clive had were dark. But they were ferocious, so these were wild caught. Wow. These things were smashing on the glass. And again, one that you looked at and thought, I don't want that thing. That's just crazy. <laughs> and I looked back and I was like, why did I walk past? Oh, yeah. Thing. But, you know, I, I think, you know, whatever for the last hour or whatever, just discussing just the variation we see in the three species from going from the the northern range all the way down to the south and to and Arge- northern Argentina and then the islands. That's a lot of variation. Yeah, for sure. I wish we could post this with, with pictures of each of them to show people how, how different they look because they are just so cool. And I, and I recommend people pick up Vin Russo's book, either the complete boa or the more complete boa, to look at those. Yeah. Get past morphs and just think about the wild types. Absolutely. They'll be blown away by the variety in those. While, while you're talking, I'm thinking of the people that aren't familiar, hopefully that will be listening to this and – they're going to be blown away not realizing that they're, you know, people think boa constrictor, there's boa constrictor and that's it, yeah. you know, and, so, and, and now they're going to have an understanding of the variety that is actually out there and yeah. available. Do you want one that's three and a half feet long or do you want one that's potentially up to 12 feet long? Right. You've got the whole, the whole range. Right. You know, and uh, do you want a big chunky one or do you want a thin one? You know, right. you really get everything in that whole, and that is, what we group as boa constrictor, you know, right? right? Yeah, it's boa stigma or boa imperata or boa constrictor, but we we group that complex as boa constrictor. Right. It's it, for me. It's as much as I love corallus. It's the it's the group that I find just amazing, just fascinating, just because of the genetic variation that exists and the and the phenotypic variation that exists across them. Right. And in another show, we'll talk about morphs. And that, again, is just through the roof. You know, when you see independent evolution of traits like P-positive in Costa Rica, on Honduras, in Nicaragua, in, in Colombia, you know, and, and I think it's just, just fascinating, you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then, you know, we can talk about breeding if you want. Um, we can talk about feeding. What do we want to do? I think feeding would be a good topic because uh, it seems to be a good topic on – Social media right now, there's a lot of people talking about feeding snakes in general and people becoming more aware of how generally as keepers we're overfeeding animals. So um, yeah. you've brought that up a couple times tonight, so I think that'd be a good one if you want to discuss that a little bit. Yeah, feeding, like whenever I first got into snakes, 
the exciting thing about part of the exciting thing about them was watching them eat. Absolutely. You know, and and therefore, the more they ate, the happier I was watching them do it. You know, the difference was that I started off with colubrids. You know, so king snakes and, and hognose snakes they need to eat relatively frequently. They're oh, active yeah. animals metabolically. They don't function the same as boas or python or hybrids. Um, and and as a result, they need to eat every every five six days or, or sometimes even more than that. And I would argue that even some pythons in Australia function the same way as colubrids, like womas, and so on. I think need to have that higher diet. You know, I think if you feed them on a on a reduced diet, they don't do as well. Um, but with boas, it's been shown with with what's been shown with pythons, with Burmese pythons, a guy called Steve Secor, a professor that was in. Um, Alabama, he showed along with Todd Casto at the University of Texas Arlington, showed these remarkable phen- phenological, physiological uh, uh, changes that happen whenever animals eat. And with the Burmese python model, they found that whenever they fed them, within four hours, you had all of these genes that were upregulating, that were switching on, and that was causing the heart to change. It was increasing in size. The blood was become, becoming really thick with plasma. Um, the intestines were remodeling. And I, I believe the, the microvilli, the little fingers in the intestines that are sticking out were becoming longer. Just remarkable variation in the physiology of the organism. And you imagine, right, it's costly and it's stressful to grow organs. And within four hours, these animals were doing that. Mm-hmm. And that that change was lasting for about two weeks. And then you get this, uh, this atrophy of those back into their normal sizes and changing back. If we're feeding a snake every five or seven days, like a boa, you're not allowing it to go through that whole physiological um, that, that pattern. Right. I guarantee that no matter where we go on the planet, with the exception of some urban populations, where there's an, a, an abundance of rodents, if we go into the Sonora Desert, or we go into Guyana or Suriname or Nicaragua, these animals are not eating every seven days. And I would be surprised if they're eating more than twice a month, maybe once a month, getting a rodent. You know, they'll sit beside little trails, rodent trails, but they're not getting, they're not eating all the time. And when they eat, they're eating whatever they can get, and then they're retreating. And that can be for, for weeks, you know. So you imagine this animal feeds and it retreats. It's, it's going to sit there for a couple of weeks digesting that meal. Yeah. And it's just going through the whole pattern and returning back to that. At, at two weeks, or roughly around two weeks, those genes that have been switched on switch off. Right. Like, Back under normal. When uh, when Rob, uh, Eric, Owen, and myself went to Australia, we saw a, a glaring example of that. I feel, and Rob, you probably agree. Um, the first night we were there, we found uh, brown water python and typical size and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I don't remember if we found a couple of them, Rob, or not. But you know, certainly we had experience with animals in captivity um, and the sizes that we see and. Uh, Rob found an animal that was in basically Darwin in a botanical park. And this animal, I can send you a picture of it. I mean, Rob, that animal was what, every bit of six, seven, eight feet long? Yeah, probably yeah. more like 10 or 11 feet. Yeah. You know, what, five it, it inches around? It, it, it was a monster. And, and something like, you know, when you first see it, you think an olive python, that's how large yeah. it was. And it's just because it was in a botanical park close to Darwin and, and you know, Gavin. talking to Gavin, um, you know, we're all just saying that there's just so many rats and different prey items that were so readily available to this animal. It was just yeah, taking advantage of that. Breed. It was probably not a viable breeder or anything. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, now it's probably, you know, if escaping predation. Once you get to that size, you know, there's, it really is escaping predation for many other animals, if, especially if it's getting to die where it can continue to grow. Yeah, that's. I, I remember seeing that picture, and I was just blown away by it because we think water python as four feet, five feet, you know, pushing. Yeah, that was a behemoth. It was so and that's, huge, and, basically, and that's basically what we're you're saying we're doing to the boas in captivity. Yeah. I think, and the hog island boas are the perfect example of that. You know, I think um, because you can grow them to that size doesn't mean physiologically they should grow to that size. Otherwise we would see all of the population being closer to that size than the smaller size. Right. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm a firm believer that, um, you know, Bill Hughes uses this term benign neglect, you know, or it's uh, kind of leaving things alone and not feeding right. it too often. And, and I've followed the same 
Trey, you know, from, from speaking to Vin Russo um, many years ago and hearing the way he fed and then looking at Steve Secor and Todd Casto's work, it made complete sense to me that these animals are not have not evolved to eat every week. We might love it because it looks great. You know, we're watching these things eat and so on. But but physiologically, it's just detrimental for them. You've, you've probably seen the odd post on Facebook over the last number of years where they'll get a a, you know, an eight foot boa or a nine foot boa and cut it open because it died at six years old or seven years old. And it's just fat bodies all the way through. Yeah. And, and they're wondering why their, their animal is not reproducing or it's producing high numbers of slugs and so on. We see the same thing with humans. Nick Mutton will talk about this here. Right. You know, you see overweight or obese humans have fertility problems. The same thing happens with snakes. Right. You know, I heard a breeder, a well-known breeder a number of years ago say that boas have at most three good litters in them. And I think that that is just complete nonsense. Having produced so many litters of Sonoran boas where females have produced eight or nine litters for me and still produce um, because they've been fed and given a year off and they've not been forced. I think it's if they want to try and feed it and breed it every year, yeah, you might get three litters and then the animal will die. Right. But if you're keeping the animal you know, in a, a more healthy state, feeding it a reduced diet, letting it go through those periods of fasting and feasting, I think you're going to have a longer lived animal. I, I think I've, I've talked about this before, or I've mentioned it to many people before. And whenever I lived in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, I was um, gifted a snake that at that point, um, at their last count, it was something like 48 or 49 years old. It was a boa, a boa imperator. Um, it was a Colombian and it had been brought in, the guy got it when it was three feet long, and this was 45 or 46 years earlier. Um, he fed it a squirrel once a month. So he went into his yard and he shot a squirrel, and he fed a, a squirrel once a month, and he didn't feed it in the winter because he couldn't get squirrels. And this animal was, was 48, 49 years old easily. I had it for three or four years, and then I gifted it to a reptile rescue to use in – in, in, in exhibits and, 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 and talks where they talk about longevity in these animals. They're not these seven or eight-year-old animals that then die obese. These are, this was a lean, again, that loaf of bread kind of shape. And one of the things that I found, find most interesting in it was, you know, when we see our, like our dogs getting old, they get kind of get gray in the muzzle. This animal was all orange speckling in the face. And I've never seen it on another animal. And I'm, I'm convinced that that was an age-related kind of... Um, That's pretty cool. Uh, you know... There was a couple of years I did try and breed it for a couple of years because I just thought trying to get those genes into captivity would have been amazing. But yeah. it had a lot of interest in breeding, but it never it never produced. Um, but it, that's possible because it, it was never cycled at all in its, in, its, in its existence in captivity. It was kept isolated for its entire life. You know, right. what a, an incredible animal. And it showed me that these animals are not young. They, they, they're not dying at 10 or 11 or younger. And I see that in my own collection because my... Um, I've got boas. I moved to the U.S. 17 years ago. I've got animals that I brought over as adults 17 years ago still in my collection, and they're still right. breeding. Right. Sonoran boas. I've got uh, many of my Costa Rican boas um, are um, in that 15, 16 year range and still breeding and very healthy and very happy. I think so, temperatures. Yeah. I think temperatures, along with feeding, yeah, add to that longevity also because having them sure. at, in the high hyper drive high metabolism with these warm temperatures that a lot of people like to keep that all the time is another thing that shortens their lifespan. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. You know, having, you know, spent so much time in Costa Rica, um, if we might think about Costa Rica as being warm, you know, maximum temperatures, that's fine. But when you get into the rainforest where the canopy cover um, extends throughout it, you know, you're sitting in the, in the low eighties at the ground. Right. You know, and, uh, these animals are not sitting at an, an ambient of 86 or whatever, you know. Right. So, so I keep a hot spot of mine sitting at 87 or 88. The animals will normally sit around the 82 to 84 range. And I'm very lucky in that, uh, in that, where I keep my snakes, they're in a basement, and they're all in freedom breeder um, enclosures, and the heat's at the back, and I don't regulate it. I keep that on at, at 87 or 88. Um, uh, degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year, um, because my I'm in a, we have a basement in in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That basement drops down to about 65 degrees in the winter, which means that the front of those cages drops down to about 70 or 72 degrees. 
And what I'll find is all of my boas starting in November, once that temperature is getting down to that temperature, um, in December they'll move from the mid-range, the 82, 84, into the 72, 73, 74 kind of range, and they'll sit there. Mm-hmm. I stopped feeding my snakes in um, in uh, November. From March to November, I feed my animals, February to, to November, and I feed them um, sparsely at the, at the beginning of it. In February, I'll feed them about every 10 days for adults. For babies, I'll feed every 7 to 10 days. And in November, prior to that there, just before cooling them, for about three or four weeks, I'll feed them every seven to ten days, just putting on weight. In between that, I feed my adult females every three weeks, um, sometimes four weeks, and my adult males about the same. So a five-foot Costa Rican might get a large rat every three weeks or four weeks, maybe two weeks depending. The males are definitely further apart. You know, they're, they're always on a three- or four-week kind of cycle. I'm feeding on a small rat as an adult male. So I feed them really sparsely. And then from November through to end of February, they don't get a thing, mm-hmm. you know, which is wonderful because then you don't have to clean your snakes. Right. You know, <laughs> it's a wonderful time of the year. Um, and at that point, you know, again, I've said it, I think Nick Mutton said it, that's whenever I see the animals growing most. You know, they seem to put on length at that point. But... They're cooling and they're cooling naturally in my room, so they're sitting at like that seventy-two degree point, and then I pair them in like January first. And I, I, I know many people breed earlier, but I, I've always done January first, put them together, and I see ovulations around March or April time and babies in you know July, August, September. Um, and you know I find with mine because the temperatures then warm up in February, March, April time, so they're going back into that kind of returning to that mid-range temperature and then basking, you know, so it's a, I've been very lucky with my room. I'm dreading it whenever I move to see what happens to the temperatures of that room, depending on what kind of place I have them in, whether it's a, a walkout basement or a separate building. But, um, um, you know, you've mentioned it before and other people's have talking about the rhythm of the room and when yeah. you move animals, they kind of lose that cycle. Yeah. Now, this could be catastrophic for me. Yeah. Out, you know? <laughs> uh, but, but what will not change is the way I feed them. And that's sparsely. Babies, yeah. I feel every seven days because I think they need it. Right. And as they get a little bit older, every 10 days, and then every two weeks. Um, and based on the adult size, I'll, I'll switch between two, three, or four weeks for feeding them. Right. And the biggest one might get a jumbo rat once a month, but most of them are on large rats every three weeks. Yeah, I'm pretty pretty similar in, in all your cycling and feeding. Yeah. Pretty much the same in my collection. I'm curious, uh, what do you use for substrate? For Do you use different substrates for different boas, or do you generally do the same for all? Or I've gone through the whole range in the last nearly 30 years. I, you know, I, I went through a phase of using Aspen, and I liked it. I went through a phase of using newspaper printed and unprinted, and it was fine. I'm now using the kind of indented kind of paper that I get from Uline, and it works great. Mm-hmm. Um, I really liked it. I like the indentations in it because I think it gives the animals something to, to hold on a bit more traction. Yeah. And I'll put a couple of pieces of um, like PVC pipe in there to get them to move over it so it actually will increase muscle tone. Right. I think it's beneficial for them to get some level of enrichment in, a, in an enclosure, even in a rack. But I, I like that. You know, I, you know, for my tree boas, I use um, either kind of like the cocoa chip type stuff or else I use cypress mulch just from mm-hmm. Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, all these cages behind me that people can't see, they've got some um, Ruschenberg rye in the bottom and emeralds up on top. They've all got cypress mulch from, from Home Depot that I that I use because the animals never touch the ground. Right. Now I go in spot, clean it, clean up, and, and move on. Um, I've thought about using it for some boas. You know, here in Oklahoma, the humidity is not very high. So, you know, you're just constantly watching out for whenever they're coming into a shed and, and making sure you're... you're keeping the place a little bit more humid in their enclosure, moving the water bowl over to the, to the warm side and so on. And I thought about maybe putting in a tray of like, um, like a cat litter tray of like cedar um, mulch or whatever, just to see if that will increase the humidity. But I, I haven't done it yet, but I bought a couple of bags of cedar today or of cypress mulch today um, for some new arboreal enclosures I'm setting up at home, but I might put some in with some, some boas that have just a little bit of time, uh, cover time shedding. Yeah, but, but so, so go ahead. Yeah, that is like the paper from Uline. I think it's great. Yeah, buy it, roll, pull it out, cut it, fold it, and it's straight. I used to use, um, I used to use um, unprinted packing paper that I would buy at 
uh, at Lowe's um, because the way you get it, I would take a two sheets, I would fold and you know, put it into the, into the CV70 tub, fold it, turn it over, and you have like four of those pieces. It was great. It was really quick. Yeah. But with with the roll from um, Uline, it's just pull it out, tear it, put it in. It's so quick. Yeah. You know, well, clean and it absorbs. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. You know, hold the water like on on the surface. It actually absorbs into it. So it's easy. easy right. Easy One of the things with the Uline, because I have that also, um, that I found that uh, I find very rewarding is being able to just judge the length and give it a pair and it fits in the cage every time. I'm like, yes, I got it again. 14 and a half centimeters. <laughs> or, sorry, 14 and a half inches. That's it. You know? the, the, the pain with it, um, with my larger Freedom Breeder tubs, I think they're the Freedom Breeder 90s, I think they are, with the window at the front. Mine have the water bowl insert. Yeah. So I've, I've always got like a, a scalpel blade or, you know, an exacto knife there just to kind of circle right. it and set it onto it. Um, but yeah, I'm exactly the same. I was actually, um, I have a bunch of, I was cleaning up one rack last night. So I think it's like uh, 12 CB 70s. So I just, I tore all the paper early. I just did it so that I could then go in and go. And I was exactly the same. I was like, well, if I, if I pull it this far, that's exactly <laughs> right. So I kept trying to do that <laughs> every time. Yeah. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah, it so, worked out so, pretty good. So, so one thing I wanted to mention is with my Amarilli, um, what I've noticed is I've used an Aspen with them because they are the blood python of bows, like yeah, we were saying. Yeah. But what I've been doing is I've been giving them like three or four inches. And what I've noticed is they actually burrow in that and they'll sit with their head yeah, out nice. of the Aspen as a blood python would when they're ready to feed. Um, so I, I just like watching that. And then they've actually compacted the material so much that if they crawl out, there's actually still that tube left yeah. in the cypress, and they'll go back and get into that same position again when they're hungry. Yeah, so it's, I think the burrowing is important for some snakes. I was talking to a friend who had sold some snakes to in the past, and he had a fee, he had a male of a pretty rare genetic combination of Costa Rican boas that was just gone off food and it was losing weight. And I said, right, well, if you feed live, it's worthwhile checking for parasites. Um, sometimes a flagell shot can actually get them going, you know. Um, and he got he, he got a fecal done, no parasites. But what he did do was he changed from using I think newspaper or paper towel to he put in like a, a so I think it was coconut bark or mulch or whatever. And he said the snake instantly buried into it. And after not feeding for months, that night it took a meal. Hmm. And it's probably a security thing, right? It's getting yeah. that a bit. I think it's important to watch your animals and if they're not feeding to think about it. it's very simple to change the substrate and to see what they do like another thing that i that i did after um moving away i'll tell you why i got out of aspen i know rob wants to say something i saw his, his hand go beside but i will just say this I, I, I for one period of time we were shredding so much paper coming into our house from junk mail that i was using that in enclosures that shredded paper and it, it worked out great um it was just a pain in the ass you know you had to start removing staples and stuff the reason I got stopped using Aspen was very simple. Right, the first time I used it in North Carolina, I got it in a shop, and I and it brought mites in with it. Mm. You know, and I thought this sucks. And I spent time, you know, I got rid of all those mites, whatever it was, 15, 16 years ago. I got back into it um, a handful of years ago, and I liked it for boas. Um, but the reason I got out of it is because my basement flooded. And uh, we had some really bad storms in Oklahoma, and my basement flooded. So you can imagine uh, the power went out, so my sump pump stopped working, and I started watching my basement flooding. So I was moving boas to higher tubs because I had 100, 120 snakes in there. Um, thankfully, nothing happened with the snakes. They were all fine. But the two bags of aspen exploded because they soaked up water, and then yeah. they – so. I'm watching this sea of aspen appearing throughout my basement. <laughs> oh, geez. And you can imagine what, a, you know, a, a basement, my, my house is 100 years old. So you know, there's a lot of stuff in there as well. There's washing machine, dryer, all that kind of stuff, some tools. Everything was coated in aspen. And it was like over a three-day event, I'm getting the water out, and then I'm trying to clean up all this aspen. And then I was going on vacation. <laughs> it was hell. So from that point in time. You have an aspen phobia? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, you were going to say something? Well, I was just going to say the common theme of the podcast is that we all use the intensive craft paper from Uline. Uh, but I, I used to do the roll yeah. thing. I've shifted to the pre-cut. Yeah. It's way easier. And then I, I do have to then cut down from the pre-cut 18 by 24 size or use multiple sheets or whatever. But that's definitely a common theme. I love, Warren, that you got into all the, the oh, notations yes. on um, oh, yes. kind of burst feeding, the upregulation and downregulation. Keith and I had talked about that on the Lost episode in the sense that in the same way, I think there's yeah. a lot of people will cycle through an up and down regulation and not feed more frequently than that. Alternatively, you can feed the heck out of them when they're upregulated and just have that be a really short window, and that's more what I do. Uh, but we're doing kind of the same thing, but in the yeah, sense right. of your window of feeding yeah. is February to November. Mine's more like April through September, and then even with fallow periods on either yeah. kind of in that June, yeah. uh, late May through mid-June, and then uh, on the backside of July, they have a little window in the middle, in that end of June into July window. But other than that, I mean, heck, I could feed them every day, but I'm feeding them small stuff, you know, Where, but I might feed them five days out of seven or five days out of eight, and then they'll go three weeks, or they might go six weeks, depending on where they fit into that window, so that we're doing similar stuff. So I thought that was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the key there is feast and famine. You know, you put them through those feast periods, which they will find in the wild, where you look at this whole glut of, of, of animals, you know, that, that tie into the wet season and births and so on, and then you get periods of famine where they're not getting anything and i think we need to realize that that is these animals have evolved over millions of years to that yeah we're we're domesticating them but it doesn't doesn't mean that they're that we changed their physiology in such a way that that can that can be beneficial to them just look at the health and the longevity of animals and i think that's more important to think about sadly many people when they look at more or animals they think more of dollar signs and how many litters they can get but for me i've produced from single animals hundreds of animals from them by keeping them on this kind of reduced feeding and that's over a longer period of time and i and i always give them a year off um there's times where a female will start to cycle and i try to stop that you know but i'll keep an eye on follicle development you know i, I palpate my boas every year and if i see a female that had bred the year previous and she starts developing big follicles and i'll think maybe i will pair it because i don't want them producing infertile ova but uh, they tend not to they tend to go um, because of that feeding cycle, they tend to go a year on, a year off. Uh, and some of the smaller, the island bows, are even a year on and two years off. So I think we've covered geography, we've covered, covered species variation and range, we've covered diet, um, and we've covered... So, so for breeding, you know, I, as I said, I can talk about Sigma and Imperator, and the only difference between those two is that I find that the Sigma get a little bit colder, produce bigger litters of smaller babies. Um, I can't talk about boa constrictor because I've never bred boa constrictor. Um, I know that they breed in an off cycle compared to Imperator, or I believe they do. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm, I'm not one for that. And I think in a future episode, maybe we'll bring uh, someone on, we'll focus on constrictor, and we'll actually bring someone on that has bred or does work more exclusively with constrictor, constrictor, and they can talk about the variation that they find and how they breed them. Right. Yeah, I think there's, like Rob always says, there's still a lot of meat on the bone here um, dealing with individual species. And and also, like you said, uh, we can get into the morphs and all that, too. So there's still a lot left. Um, yeah, we, we, yeah we're, just, we're just touching on the basics of the complex right. today. Right. And it's, uh, but even within, you know, you can have an entire episode just talking about Corn Island, but was for good Absolutely. Yeah. You know? So um, I think I just, we, we just want to set this up as being that introduction because i want people to to listen to this and think oh wow there's something for me here right you know, they're not what i thought they were these big snakes absolutely you know there's so much variation and, and when we when we do an episode on color morphs and pattern morphs that's going to hopefully interest people as well because you'll have a group of people that also are interested in the color and the pattern morphs and they'll realize that there's just an incredible diversity yeah. um, within this uh, species complex yeah, and, and and in general, I find them to be a very hardy species. Um, you know, yeah. a lot of them you, you will not fa fall to our shortcomings as a keeper, um, and they also are pretty resilient and bounce back. I think one of the most common issues is with the true red tails, like you had mentioned earlier, where you can get this regurgitation um, 
not that like the same as in emeralds, but you do get this uh, period where I've, I've had it myself where, uh, you know, pushing the animal a little bit or something, you get a regards from them and it takes you a long time to recover from it, but they do recover from it um, as long as you, you handle it the right way. Um, and you've seen that in other, in other boas. You've seen it in boa um, sigma. So, for example, um, the leopard boas, um, whenever they first came in from Germany, um, I think people overfed them and they started regurging. And a lot of people lost their animals. I know Peter Kyle had, if any, if anybody this listing was was ever at Peter Kyle's place, his Central American boas were the biggest animals I've ever seen. Yeah, I was there maybe 16 years ago looking at Nicaraguan high boas, and they were the size of a Colombian boa. Right. And he had a leopard boa that was just the same, and he said he'd lost a whole bunch of other leopard boas due to regurgitation. Um, I know that people that work with Honduran boas, they seem to be a little bit more delicate and they, they tend to not handle bigger meals very well. Um, but, um, you know, so the regurgitation can happen, I think, throughout the, the boa complex. Mm-hmm. But the true red tails, regurgitation is one, and it can set in if they do, if you're not careful with it, it can set in as bad as regurgitation in an emerald where the animal will die from it. Yeah. Healing is, resp- is respiratory. I've seen that more in true red tails just because of the slightly higher humidity requirements. Mm-hmm. Um, as for the other the Sonoran boas, geez, they're, they're bomb-proof. You know, those things, they could sit with a dry water bowl for three weeks and come out, they seem to be fine, you know. Right. But in fresh water, they ignore it. But they um, they seem to be just really robust animals. Central Americans, I find, very robust animals. People talk about them being nippy. I don't really see that with them. Again, I don't handle mine a lot, but I don't see them being very nippy. And I think... If you want an animal that you, you can handle, you just get it young and you hold it. And you do what you do for any other other thing. Yeah, you know? I think nippy is a relative term. You know, I'm not yeah. sure I understand. Well, apparently, apparently, my phone doesn't like, agree with that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I, I've also said to people, that, you know, they were like, "Does it bite?" And I'm like, "Well, you bite, so therefore, every animal bites." Right. You know, so, you know, you need to know the animal. Right. Uh, and that's great. You know, you can get all of these from babies and raise them up. That is one other thing that I will say. The people are getting into them. Get it small and raise it up so it gets into the rhythm of your rooms. The, right. your, your cycling, your day-night cycle, your temperature variation. Even in a centrally heated house, your house will vary in temperature throughout the, rain, throughout the year. Getting them young, if you want to breed them, it's going to be a much easier, much smoother time. You know, that they'll breed at a, at a, at a three- or four-year or five years of age instead of trying to get some of these bigger animals that are more difficult to, to get established, even if they're captive bred. Right. Yeah. Yep, agreed. Yeah. All right. I don't know if you guys have anything else you want to add, if we want to wrap this up. I think we're good. I think we've touched upon boas. I hope it excites people. Um, and again, if, if people want to talk about more or have more questions, feel free to, to email me. Um, I'm always happy to talk boas, you know. So. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, Warren, how how would people get a hold of you? Can they? Can you have uh, you uh, obviously have the website that they can contact you on? So, the easiest way uh, is either through uh, my Facebook or my Instagram page. Um, so they are. If you look, don't look up Warren Booth on Facebook because you'll find my page and I'll I'll not friend you unless I know you because yeah. I don't post pictures of snakes. I tend to not. It's all family and that kind of nonsense. But the uh, Boa Booth. Um, that's a very highly original name. You can you can you can imagine um, <laughs> that on Facebook or on Instagram, and I I get messages all the time, so I'm happy to to um, to answer anything that I get on that there. You know, so they would be the two kind of platforms that I would use um, to try and contact me. Yep, I would say uh, for me too. You can just uh, private message me on Facebook, and uh, we can take it from there. All right. Well, uh, thanks for listening to Boas, Boas, Boas with Warren, Rob, and myself. Uh, Please check out the NPR networks on iTunes, Spotify, or whatever app you may be using. And we hope you will check out next month's episode where, what will we be talking about, guys? I I think we will be talking about possibly emeralds. Northern emerald tree boas. Ah, that's it. Are are we going to have basins and northerns? Uh, We can talk about both for sure. Yeah. If they're green and they sit on a tree and they're boas, I think we can talk about it. (laughs) All right. So next month, uh, that will be uh, Emerald Tree Boas. Uh, Until then, enjoy your animals and follow your passion, guys. Mm